A very warm welcome to Bhutan This Week, our weekly news magazine program with me, Sunam Pim. Our top stories this week. His Holiness the Jaykhempo ordains nuns from Nepal. A possible site identified for construction of a bridge over Mao River. Some local leaders and companies in Japan offer to help students of the Learn and Earn program. His Holiness the Jaykhempo ordained more than 100 nuns from Nepal's Drukgawakil nunnery recently. The two-day ordination ceremony was held at the Namdroling Genzindrasa in Linsi. Kinken Domgi or Vow of Kinken Pemakarpo is a vow that nuns and monks take to practice Drukpakaji religion in a monastery. Once the vow is taken, they have to refrain from getting involved in negative activities that harm other ancient beings. We feel very privileged and very happy to have this uh, opportunity to come here and take this vow, as this vow is a very, um, how do we say it, it's a, it's a lineage from the Kun Khen Pema Karpo, and uh, we are very happy and very privileged to have this vow here, uh, as we are the nuns of the uh, present Kelvang Drukpa, the His Holiness the Kelvang Drukpa. To receive uh, vows under the blessings of His Holiness the Jakamp is a very holy opportunity, very holy, because it's a very pure lineage that he holds, and uh, for me it's very, very important. Uh, I really think we need to be very unsectarian, respect all the masters, all the lineages, but we need to have a main focus, a, a tree from which different branches we can pay, pay homage. But this for me, it's very important to keep a very pure transmissions of the, the, the teachings and the practices. After taking their vow, the nuns also offered Kusung Tugimende to His Holiness the Jekembo. His Holiness also granted scarves to the nuns. For Sonam Sri in Linsi, Isha Gelton, BBS News. His Holiness the Jekempo is presiding over Linsi's annual Melam Chemo at Namdroling Gensendrata in Aosu. The Great Prayer Ceremony, which began recently, will end with a Sangya Menla blessing next week. Along with the devotees, around 500 monks from across Linsi are attending the ceremony. The Bazaguru Doom Group at Chetikora in Tashiansi concluded on Tuesday. Gesutiku Jimitenze Wampo presided over the prayer ceremony, which lasted for almost two weeks. It was conducted for the peace and prosperity in the country and the world at large. The Gesutiku will administer a blessing for the devotees gathered. The Buddhist practice of life release or tether, although founded on the good intention of protecting living organisms, poses significant conservation consequences. According to a recently released study on aquatic conservation on a reputed online library, Wiley, if inappropriate invasive species are released, it could be dangerous for the conservation of the ecosystem. The study raises awareness to ensure that good intentions do not result in destructive environmental outcomes. In Bhutan, the study says tether practices are arising as a significant concern, especially for freshwater fish biodiversity. The study mentions African sharp-toothed catfish are imported live from Bangladesh via Kolkata and sold for release. But the species is associated with significant ecosystem disruption. The African sharp-toothed catfish is listed as a potential pest and its predatory feeding behavior could prove as a risk to local fish species. As per the study, at present there is little awareness and education on the unintended outcomes from life release practices for aquatic and other wildlife. The study therefore recommends preventive considerations for ecologically safe life release. People should release fish that are native to geographical range. Exotic fish should not be released as they might wipe out native species disrupting the aquatic ecosystems. The fish should be released in numbers that will not dominate the ecosystem in the rivers they are placed. This will ensure a balanced ecosystem. Fish is one of the least studied and threatened fauna in the country. 
It is under threat because of the rapid decline of its population in the Himalayan region from pollution, habitat loss and fishing. Sunam Pim for BBS News. A new frog species, Leptobrachium bompu, belonging to class Eastern Spadefoot toad, is recorded for the country from Sarbong. With this, Bhutan now has 57 amphibian species. The record of the new species was published in the Journal of Threatened Taxa. It is an international journal for publication of research, findings and reviews related to conservation and taxonomy of flora, fauna and fungi. This lone male frog was spotted at Pakhola in Jimicholing at an altitude of 1610 meters above sea level in 2015. Pakhola is one of the primary tributaries of Simca River. The watershed is known to host amphibians due to presence of natural lakes and swampy areas. The area is also a habitat for other frog species. Jigmitenzin, the forester who discovered Bompu, says out of 1.42 km length of Pakola stream, the frog was recorded only from one spot, which indicates the rarity of its population. This species has distinctive eye color, blue, vertical iris, and noticeably wrinkled skins, which differentiate it from other species. He also added that its presence is an indication of Bhutan's rich biodiversity. It's likely that more new species could be discovered in the country if research activities are extended to other districts. Forester Jigmitenzin carried out the study along with his friend Jigmit Sutim Wangil on the new frog record to help understand the range and conservation status of the species. Leptobrachium bompu draws its name from a campsite called Bompu in Arunachal Pradesh where it was first discovered. It is also found in China. The study suggests that the frog probably prefers moss laden rocks for hiding, damp and swampy areas for sustenance, and slow flowing hill streams for breeding and reproduction. The study concludes that, owing to rarity of the species population, a separate study on abundance, distribution patterns, and conservation threats be carried out. The species is also relatively new to science, because of which there is a lack of adequate information on its significance in the ecosystem. Pup Game for BBS News. Another development towards constructing a bridge over Mao River in Gelifu, the government has identified a possible site. The Ministers for Information and Communications and Works and Human Settlement visited the site recently. The Flood Engineering and Management Division of the Works and Human Settlement Ministry suggested the possible site as part of its primary studies on Mao River protection. It stretches from below the Gilifu Tomdes water treatment plant till fishery area, which is about half a kilometre. The Department of Roads will carry out further feasibility study. The Department of Roads side, uh, our uh, plan is to uh, carry out a detailed feasibility study and also detailed uh, project uh, report of this uh, Maokola. If everything uh, works out well, uh, if the, it is feasible and uh, if, uh, if uh, we, uh, we feel that it's going to be feasible, then there are high chances that we will be starting this bridge uh, within the 12th five-year plan. While visiting the site, the ministers also met with the local leaders of four works located across Mao River. The Information and Communications Minister, who is also the MP of Gelifu constituency, asked them to render necessary support while carrying out the project's technical study. <laughs> The pledge of constructing a bridge over the river has been there since 2008. However, it could not materialize. We did not have the fund to construct it. There were other problems as well. But now, after a decade, I sincerely hope we will have a bridge over Mao River. The government has a budget outlay of 400 million year term and the 12th five year plan for the Mao Bridge project. For Kamawangdi in Sarbang, Kilijem, PBS News. 
The Rafe Koshila bypass at Langtil in Tongsa is yet to be officially opened for traffic. But people living along the bypass are already reaping the benefits of the new route. With many travellers frequenting the place, it has helped enhance the livelihood of locals. This 17-kilometer bypass, which was completed last year, shortens the distance between Tromsa town and Langtilge work. Travel time is reduced by almost an hour and a half. The older route takes almost three hours. Realizing the potential for business, many locals have already constructed houses and shops along the bypass, while some are purchasing land and constructing houses. At present, there are about 15 shops along the bypass. <laughs> With only the old route down there in the past, all the shops were also there and we had to travel down there for our shopping. Now more people are looking to buy or lease land here to do business. So I think there will be more shops and houses here which is going to benefit us a lot. Because of the bypass, firstly, travel time between our place and Tromsa is shortened and now we need not have to use the old route. Secondly, more customers visit our shops and we are able to earn more. Now we need not have to carry goods on our backs unlike in the past because we have a road here. Even agricultural works can be done easily because we can carry the materials in our vehicles now. But the ongoing construction of bridges on the route has held up the opening of the bypass for traffic. The new route is expected to be opened in around three months. This Yurmung bridge, which is now about 90% complete, has held up the opening. However, the bridge at Dangdung has been completed. Locals began to use the bypass since last month. For Pasa in Tronsa, Chuni Dama for BBS News. In the latest case updates of the Learn and Earn students in Japan, students have been offered help by Japanese community leaders and company owners. The local leaders and companies who met with the team of parents' committee members currently in Japan have promised to help the students in getting working visas and jobs. The team has so far met with five companies and a few local leaders in different parts of Japan. The committee's legal officer said prior to their visit, the local leaders and companies were not aware of the problems faced by the Bhutini's students. After reaching here, we attended press conferences with media people and now many Japanese and language schools understand the problem. Now they know students have huge loans back in Bhutan and they have great love for Bhutanese people. Schools also started helping students and some companies also came forward to help our students. While meeting with some companies in Osaka yesterday, the team discussed on how they could render help to Bhutanese students. In Osaka, companies promised to help over 100 students in processing working visas. They also discussed about conducting job fairs for Bhutanese students. Some hotels and private enterprises also assured us to provide jobs to few Bhutanese. Only thing is we have to organize and share our problems with them. If a team from a government visits here, it is likely the problem will be solved within a short period of time. Meanwhile, this has left the students in Japan hopeful. It seems the parents' team visiting Japan is going to be beneficial for us. We see them engaging in different discussions and press conferences with relevant stakeholders. We are optimistic that they will come up with some fruitful solutions. Our student visas expire on 15th of this month and we have to come back to Bhutan. On the other hand, we have applied for working visas 
but it is yet to be confirmed. However, we have now been assured by these companies that they will call us back if our visas get approved. In about two weeks, the team met with over 400 students in various Japanese language schools. The team found that only one student has a part-time job provided by the Putinese agent through its counterpart company in Japan. SND has not provided proper guidance nor managed the students when they reached Japan. We were told that students were confused in workplaces. Some were even physically abused by supervisors in working places. Despite there being some good companies here in Japan, BEO had only placed students in companies where they got commission. With their student visas expiring this month, some students have already applied for working visas, while some are in the process of applying. Now some students are applying for working visa. They have to pay around 350,000 to 400,000 Japanese yen to the agent. And it may again create problems since the agent is involved. So we request the government to take immediate intervention. The team plans to meet with the rest of students before returning home next week. They have also scheduled meetings with politicians in Japan. For Pemasawang, Pup Game for BBS News. After more than five months since they left Bhutan, the separated conjoined twins Nima and Dawa along with their mother returned home on Thursday. They were in Australia for a separation surgery. The twins were born joint at the thoraco-abdominal region. Contrary to the way left, the conjoined twins returned home in separate arms. Inside the arrival terminal, it was an emotional reunion. The 40-year-old father of the twins had been waiting anxiously. I felt sad they had to leave for Australia on their own. I kept worrying how the operation would go, whether they would be separated successfully. Today, meeting them after the surgery, I am very happy. I almost broke down in tears. The mother, Pumchu Sangmo, had been equally worried. She had never imagined that her children will be able to live separate lives. When my daughters were born conjoint, my family and I did not know what to do. The doctors told me the girls can be separated in Australia. They told me not to worry. I was happy with the news. By then, the girls were turning 18 months old. However, in between, we faced some difficulties getting the visa. I hope that the government could help us with that since we got sponsors for the surgery in Australia. I was worried. I feared my daughters could never be able to undergo the surgery. But after reaching Australia, her worries were put to rest. She said everyone, including the Bhutanese living there, have been supportive. On road to Thimpo, the 19-month-old twins visited Tachok Lagang, an expression of gratitude for their successful surgery. <laughs> the three had left for a separation surgery in October last year. They underwent treatment at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne a month later. Post-surgery, Pumchu and her girls lived in the Children First Foundation's Kilmore retreat before returning home yesterday. The Victorian government paid for the procedure and recovery while the Children First Foundation, an Australian-based charity, covered the travel and accommodation expenses. With additional information from Sangeet Chazam, Kilite, BBS News. Ever since the Desung program was instituted, Desups have played a pivotal role in volunteering during disasters, crowd controlling at various events and helping out during other occasions. Of all the voluntary services, crowd controlling at 
Pasa Tundra Amingi in Chuka is considered one of the toughest. Around 80 Desups of Chuka and Samsi are currently rendering their services at the ongoing Hindu festival, the Shivratri. Desups from Chuka and Samsi start their journey a day ahead of the main day of Shivratri. Since the place is located at the border, people travel via Hasimara and Kalachini, two towns under the Indian state of West Bengal. This is the fifth time Desups have been volunteering for the Shivratri event there. The Ne is considered a sacred place visited by Guru Rinpoche and was discovered by Tangtong Galpo. It is believed Dertun Dugda Doji also spent a few years meditating here. During the Shivratri, more than a hundred thousand Indians visit the place every year to pray and make offerings. Since it is located inside a steep cliff, devotees have to walk through narrow paths, climb steep steps and also cross a river. Several serious casualties were reported in the past, but since the Desup started helping out, such incidents have gone down. Since 2015, we started coming here to help out. The Ne is located in our area, but the visitors during the Shivratri are all Indians. During these three days, hundreds and thousands of Indian devotees come here. The place is very risky, but we Desups are doing our best. Desups come here, coordinate well and support each other. Due to this, everything is going on smoothly here. People appreciate our duty and we can see the number of pilgrims increasing every year. We are trying our best day and night. The security here has become very popular. We feel very secure. Last time there were seven people in our group. This time, 12 of us have come here. And I'm sure the numbers will only increase. We want our friends to also come and see the beautiful things that are going on here. Since 2015, as per His Majesty's command, these soups are being deployed here to control and coordinate the crowd. During these three days of Shivratri, pilgrims from India visit here. They offer prayers to Lord Shiva and Parvati. Shiva is Hawangchu in our religion. It is believed that whatever we pray for, it is fulfilled here. With the support from the soups and medical team here, everything is going on smoothly. The Ni is located around 60 kilometers from Punsuling and becomes inaccessible during the monsoon season. It is also totally cut off from mobile network connectivity. The soups are expected to return to their respective stations tomorrow. For Sunampenjur in Chuka, Pupkem, Pupibis News. Well, that's all for this week. Thank you for joining us.